Um, you have heard already about the quantum Lorentz gas in Manfred Zahnhofer's lecture. Um, the Lorentz gas um, uh, is a, a much simpler system than the full Boltzmann gas because it's essentially a one particle dynamics where we have uh, uh, non-interacting particles moving in a fixed array of scatterers. Um, uh, Lorentz set this up in the in the uh, uh, in, in around 1904-1905 as a model um, of electrons moving in metal. Of course, this was pre-modern quantum mechanics, um, and he also used the um, uh, the model for the scatterers um, uh, as hard spheres. Now, of course, um, as you also, as you've seen in, in, in uh, Manfred Zahnhofer's lecture, um, we are particularly interested um, when you replace the hard spheres by, by smoother potentials, and that's what, what we'll do, in particular in the quantum setting, that's uh, important. Right, so here's the Lorentz gas. I'm interested not in the a uh, weak coupling limit where you make your potential smaller, but in the low density limit, so just like in the classical setting of, of Boltzmann and Lorentz. Um, so it means you shrink your scatterers, and as you shrink them, um, as you all know, the free path lengths, let me stick with this, the mean free path lengths increases uh, in two dimensions, like one over the, the scatterer. So if you wouldn't rescale, uh, in the limit, you would just get free motion. So we need to rescale our length and time units um, uh, um, to get a non-trivial limit. Um, in d dimensions, the mean free path length scales like 1 over the total scattering cross-section of each individual scatterer, which goes like 1 over r to the d minus 1. And so you see here, um, uh, introducing new macroscopic variables, which are denoted by x and y, um, if you scale the old micro... Th th so that's a type here, I apologize, this should be a q. Um, this is the microscopic variable, um, uh, and so rescaled by the mean free path, and you also rescale the time by the mean collision time, which scales exactly in the same way because we're moving with constant speed in this model. And so now we have a flow in this rescaled Lorentz gas, and I'm just going to show you um, the pictures, how it looks like now in these macroscopic coordinates. So this is the original picture. Um, the mean free path here is 2, and remember it, it just went up as 1 over r. So if we now rescale our space units uh, in the appropriate way so that the macroscopic mean free path in these coordinates is normalized to be 1, then the pictures just look like that. So in some sense, you just zoom out, and you, and you can see here, um, or imagine that now we expect a limiting process in the classical sense, where a particle would fly for some microscopic constant time, then scatter, um, fly in another direction, and so on. And indeed, that's what Laura's, Lauren's heuristic was based on, really following Boltzmann's original ideas, is that you get a limiting random flight process in this way um, uh, that is governed by the linear Boltzmann equation that I've written down here. So this is the linear Boltzmann equation um, that I think all of us have seen by now. Um, and uh, in the classical setting, for instance, the uh, differential cross-section that appears here for hard scatterers has this uh, explicit formula for uh, more general smooth potentials. You get um, analogous formula that, formulae that are, are well known. And even though Boltzmann's idea and Lorentz's idea was originally to um, sort of use this as a step, as was very nicely explained in, in uh, Lohr's lecture to understand the laws of thermodynamics and g give a microscopic justification for them. This, this equation has by now seen many, many uh, applications in various areas. Okay, now the derivation of the linear Boltzmann equation from this microscopic model, 
um, the Lorentz gas is, is by now quite well understood. Um, if your scatterers are placed um, at points that are random, then uh, the early works of Galavotti and Spohn uh, and Boldrigini, Bunimovic and Sinai showed that indeed you can rigorously derive the linear Boltzmann equation. Um, Galavotti and Spohn proved this in the so-called annealed situation when you keep averaging over your scatterer configuration and Boldrigini, Bunimovic and Sinai in a really beautiful paper proved that in fact the convergence holds for um, a, a typical realization of a Poisson point process as the uh, scattering centers. And um, I'm sure uh, Balin Tote in the next talk will, will uh, review that uh, bit of the literature in, in, in a bit more detail than, than I, I will do here. Um, the periodic Lorentz gas um, has some very beautiful surprising features. So if you now place your scatterers uh, on a periodic grid, as I've showed you on those slides before, there was a random and, and next to it the periodic. Um, in fact, uh, Francois Golds observed that um, because the observation that the f distribution of the free path length, so the first, the first hitting time, um, has a very heavy tail, the linear Boltzmann equation can't hold, in fact, as a limit. Um, and uh, in work with uh, Emmanuel Cagliotti, he identified the limit process in two dimensions. And then um, uh, in higher dimensions, um, Andreas Strömbergson and I were able to prove the convergence of the Lorentz gas to, to a limit process in arbitrary dimensions using a Godic theory on the, on the space of lattices. And more recently, um, we've extended this to quasi-crystals and other scatterer configurations that are not necessarily periodic, um, as well as to sort of soft, soft potentials under certain assumptions. Um, so in some sense, the situation for the boltzmann grad limit of the classical Lorentz gas is well understood. Uh, now, and um, my next step was then to say, well, what about the quantum Lorentz gas? And um, uh, the situation here is more complicated and, and uh, uh, open in general. Um, uh, there have been uh, important papers, again, by Herbert Spohn, Erdős and Yao, who looked at the weak coupling limit of the Lorentz gas on the um, kinetic scale. Um, uh, and Manfred Zahnhofer mentioned this in his lecture, where, of course, um, if you take longer times, you are in the, in the scaling limit that um, he was talking about, where we will see diffusion. Um, and uh, for me, of course, I didn't want to look at the weak coupling limit, but at exactly the same limit as in the classical setting, which is the low density limit, where you shrink the radius of your scatterers and you rescale time and space units in exactly the same way. And for the random setting, there's a very long paper by Eng and Erdős, who uh, adapted the techniques um, uh, um, uh, used in, in the paper of Erdős and Yao to deal with, with precisely this limit and where they proved, again, that in the um, annealed setting for uh, randomly distributed scatterers, um, you converge to the linear Boltzmann equation. And the obvious question now is what happens for non-random scatterer configurations, for example, and in particular for the periodic setting. Now, if you read some of the, the papers and the surveys, usually what they say the periodic case is easy, okay? Because we, know, we understand everything. Solid state physics, to a, to a big extent, is based on uh, Floquet-Bloch theory, which says that if you have a periodic potential, you can decompose it, you understand the band structures and so on. So it's solved. But it's not, and I'm trying to convince you in this lecture, it's actually not easy because uh, 
If you look at the particular scaling limits that I'll discuss, it's actually harder than the classical case. Um, and so I think this sort of slight paradox that you read the literature and, and the statement is the classical case is hard, the quantum case is easy, um, th that's not so. So I hope when you leave this lecture, I'll have convinced you. Otherwise, come and see me in the coffee break and we can, <laughs> we can continue. Um, and in particular, I'll talk about a, a paper or papers that came out recently with um, Jory Griffin, um, uh, a former student of mine who is now at the University of, of Oklahoma. Right, and in particular, what I want to uh, impress on you is that we see a new limit process in this scaling. So in precisely the same scaling used by Eng and Erdős, um, the periodic case produces something very interesting. So here's the setup. Um, we study the classical non-relativistic Schrödinger equation. Um, the quantum Hamiltonian is just given by the Laplacian plus a potential. I've put a lambda in here for reasons that become clear later. Really think of lambda as being one. So lambda is fixed. We're not looking at the low, uh, the, 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 the weak coupling limit where lambda is small. We're looking at the low density limit where the scatterers are uh, uh, rescaled in this way. So my potential V is a superposition of single side potentials, W, let's assume they're in Schwartz class, um, that are identical at each scatterer. So the W is the same at each scatterer. It's scaled by a factor of R, so it's small. And, um, and that's it. That's our potential. We'll, we'll, the idea now is that we take R to zero. So R is somehow de defining the, uh, if you like, the effect of support of this potential W if W would have compact support. Um, the solution of our Schrödinger equation is given by a unitary operator that acts on the initial state, and that's exactly given, given by this equation here, so everything's very explicit. And this is the situation we have. So if you like, you start with some initial wave packet, um, H that appeared in front of the Laplacian, you can think of uh, describing the scale of the wavelength of our initial packet. Um, this, if you remember, r to the d r to, uh, one over r to the d minus one, uh, is the mean free path. So that's our micro macroscopic scale, our classical macroscopic scale. Um, the scatterers are separated by one. And what we'll do, in fact, um, uh, the, the limit that I want to study, which I think is the most interesting limit, and that's also the one that Eng and Erdős studied, is when the size of the scatterer is comparable with the wavelength. And as you will see, the reason why this is, to me, the most interesting limit is you get a very beautiful combination between the semi-classical propagation between scattering events and then proper classical, proper quantum scattering at the scatterer. Because you can see quantum scattering because the wavelength is comparable with the size of your scatterer. Right. Um, in Manfred Zahnhofer's lecture, uh, uh, you, you saw the use of the Wigner function to describe um, the phase space distribution of uh, the quantum system. I'm using something that, that is uh, virtually equivalent to it, which is the notion of um, uh, pseudo-differential operators. Um, you see the structures is very similar here in, in, um, as, in, as in the definition of the Wigner function. For those who haven't seen this, um, let me just say the idea here is basically that you take a function in your phase space where x describes position and y the the, um, the uh, momentum of your particle, and then you associate with it an operator. And that operator, if you like, represents the phase space distribution of the quantum state you apply it to. So the precise way this operator is defined, it's written down here. So A is our, take A to be a Schwartz function on Rd cross Rd, the phase space. Then you um, apply this, 
uh, integral transform here um, to your favorite function f and that defines your op a. But now remember, and this is the really important trick, is that we need to scale things uh, correctly so we actually go into the right limit. And as you remember, um, we want to scale our space, space units um, by the mean free path. So I've put the r to the d minus 1 here. So we start with our observable. But we now measure everything on the macroscopic scale because we want to survive the macroscopic scale. We want to see a in the limit, right? the little a. And similarly, uh, remember that momentum is y. And we now scale momentum by h. h is uh, our wavelength. Okay, So we measure our momentum in, in units of the wavelength. And again, that's the right scaling to see something non-trivial in the limit. OK, so that's basically the setting. As I said, uh, if you haven't seen this, just ignore it. OK, just what you need to remember, I've associated with a classical observable in my phase space, a quantum observable. Now I'm going to take the limit, and I want to see something like the linear Boltzmann equation for the A. That's the idea. Yeah? The operators should all disappear uh, when I take this limit. OK, so these are the questions. Pick your favorite scatter configuration, P, random or deterministic, random as in Eng and Erdős, um, deterministic as in, in the lattice case. And uh, what you want to understand now is if you start with a time propagated A, so A, oh, did I define this here? Oh, yeah, it's up here, sorry. Uh, a is now um, starting with an initial quantum observable, then propagating it um, with the uh, solutions of our Schrodinger equation, so the, 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 the propagators corresponding to the Schrodinger equation. You get then an observable at time t. And the idea now is we choose a to be, the initial a, to be given by my quantized classical observable, so that's my initial state, and I propagate it. And I want to understand where is it at time t on the boltzmann grad scaling. So that's why you see again here, as in the classical setting, we measure time t in exactly the same units. And then I just test it against uh, a, a test observable b. Okay, So that's exactly like in the classical situation in terms of weak convergence. So that's like a, the quantum analog of, of, if you like, weak convergence, where we just now have an inner product in, in our operator. Uh, uh, space um, with respect to the Hilbert-Smith norm. And the question is, do we get a limit, right? A limit like this, where we want to then identify a family of operators LT that describe this limit. As you see on the right-hand side, n there's nothing quantum left here. Just the classical, the, uh, the, the inner product between, between our classical observables. And then Second question, once we have understood that there is such a LT, um, will that generate a solution of the linear Boltzmann equation? So as I said earlier, Eng and Erdős proved precisely this in a slightly different setting using Wigner or Hosimi functions. But um, the, 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 the statements uh, can, uh, can be related um, in, in, in this way. It's just, a, if you like, a slightly different topology of, of the convergence. Um, and the really interesting observation of Eng and Erdős is that you get the linear Boltzmann equation where your collision kernel, sigma, which in the classical case was the differential cross-section of a single scatterer, is given by um, this quantum mechanical collision kernel. So the delta function here makes sure that you have elastic collision, so energy is preserved, and the kinetic Incoming kinetic energy is equal to the outgoing kinetic energy. And this here is the single scattering T matrix. Um, uh, the T matrix, if you like, is a, is a, is a well-known object in, in scattering theory um, at a potential. Um, and it's um, uh, related to the, to the classical scattering S matrix um, in a very simple way. And that's exactly what you would expect here. That's what you would see if you just had one fixed potential and you would scatter at it. 
you would get an expression like this, right? So it's again exactly like in the classical setting, even though you have all these scatterers, it's not trivial at all that in, in the boltzmann grad limit you just should see each scatterer by itself, the single scattering cross-section determining the dynamics, right? So, and that's what I referred to earlier. So basically what you see here now is that in the limit, you get classical propagation until you had to hit a scatterer. Then you have quantum scattering. And then you, can, you see again classical propagation. So it's a very beautiful mixture um, and separation of the classical and quantum regime in this, in this model. Right. You don't have this in the weak coupling limit, so, so this is the result. In the weak coupling limit, what you see is that instead of the um, full T matrix squared, you see the first term in the Born approximation. So again, you can see this nice separation of classical propagation and scattering, but only first order. But it's more dense, the gas, for in the weak coupling, because... Yeah. Gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, the, the free part is unclear. I mean, the, the collisions yeah. are much more frequent. Weak, but not Correct. much more frequent. Correct. Correct. So Correct. it's this picture of fa fame in that case, right? Uh, that's right. Nevertheless, you still see the linear Boltzmann okay. equation, which is, this is, here you see it's sort of nicer because you have this classical intuition, right? It's much, so you really see the free motion happening and I mean this is the mir miracle of quantum mechanics that you see things that maybe from a classical point of view you don't really expect right in the weak coupling limit why should it be free motion for such a long time but that's that's how it is okay so here is now the answer to the question for the periodic setting, so let's just take a lattice ZD on which we place our scatterer exactly in the, in the picture that I've showed you. Um, there is a very significant underlying assumption, and which I will explain. That is what I call a generalized Barry Tabor conjecture. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain to you what this means. So, under this assumption, we can show that. Indeed, we have a family of limiting operators LT so that this convergence holds as well, just like in the random case. However, the limit is not a solution to the linear Boltzmann equation. So that might not be such a surprise because clearly the periodic setting is, is very different from uh, the random setting. And, and, um, and so, you know, I, I'm not expecting you to... to uh, uh, sort of be all shocked. However, it's important, I think, or very remarkable, that we can use the same scaling limit as in the random situation. And the process is very, very non-trivial, as I'll, I'll explain to you. And just as a, as a side remark, we could prove this theorem here unconditionally, without the barry tauber conjecture, up to second order uh, in, in lambda. So there is an expansion, which we can do. It's all a bit messy, um, but we couldn't go beyond that. So we need the conjecture to actually identify the full limiting process, which I'll now describe to you. So before I do this, let me tell you... Hmm? Can you identify the limiting object? Or? Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. And in order to do it, I'll first tell you um, how the solution of the linear Boltzmann equation looks like and then I'll compare it with my limiting object because unfortunately I don't have such a nice description in terms of a macroscopic kinetic equation. Um, so you can write down the solution of the linear Boltzmann equation as a collision series where the kth term corresponds to uh, k, the sort of the, the term describing k minus one collisions so, I don't know if we have any people online, but I hope you can see if I write it really big. Um, so, uh, what happens here is that you can think of uh, a random process that describes the solution of the linear Boltzmann equation. That is a process where you 
fly for an exponentially distributed time, then you change direction according to the uh, collision kernel sigma, the differential cross-section. You fly again uh, by an exponential distributed time that's independent of whatever happened in the past, and so on. Yeah? Um, and so what I'm writing down now is how the corresponding density involves um, and separate it out in the number of changes of directions that I see here. So the zero co co uh, co collision term is simply free propagation because you don't collide. So just, you know, move your particle x just along a straight line and you lose mass by an exponential factor. That corresponds to the exponential clock that you see in the random process, yeah? So the probability of having no collision decreases exponentially fast. That's the same in the classical setting and in the quantum setting because both are solutions of the linear Boltzmann equation. In the periodic, quant uh, in the periodic classical setting, remember I mentioned this, we actually don't have this but a algebraic decay um, of uh, uh, this factor here. So it's not exponential but it's um, of the order of 1 over t squared or t cubed, depending w which, w which type of collision you look at. Okay, and then you can write down the expression for the k minus 1 collision term uh, as an integral, where you actually see the uh, propagation and you see sort of your, your limiting random process given by these um, uh, limiting probability densities, rho lb here. And they are simply a product between exponential decay. So this corresponds to the exponential times for each of the paths. So this is the time u1 here, if you like, time u2, time u3. They're all independent and exponentially distributed. Um, and the y's here are the vectors in which we travel, the momenta. And they're also random. And as you can see, um, we, we get here independence. So this is essentially a, a Markov process um, where, you, uh, where the momenta are just related by the differential cross-section. So that's the classical setting, which many of you know and have seen. So let me now contrast this with our limiting process in the periodic quantum setting. So again, we write everything down as a collision series. And the first term, to our surprise, is again given by the same expression as in the random setting. And in contrast to the classical setting in the periodic setting where we have this algebraic tail, we have here an exponential decay. So that was a little bit of a surprise. I, I thought that what one sees a one sees some remnants here of, of the classical setting. But we're not really in this full semi-classic limit, of course, because we do quantum scattering, right? So uh, there's no inconsistency or paradox here. Um, and now the higher order term, the k minus 1 collision term, has again a similar structure as for the linear Boltzmann equation. We still see the classical transport here in our observable. Remember, A is like a density, so the evolution is sort of backwards in time. U, J are the flight times. Y, J are the momenta, just as I've plotted it here. And the, the question now is, what are the rho LM, right? And the rho LM are our collision densities, um, and they have this expression. So we can write them as um, uh, a product of several terms. Um, note here, we still have this exponential distribution on the flight times. However, the flight times also appear in this density here. Right? So there is now strong dependence, as you'll see when I, when I explain what this function GLM is. We still have the on-shell condition, so that's all good. Um, and the, um, the, uh, these densities, GLM here, so you, you see we're summing over all GLM 
Um, so it looks it looks more messy, but this is is the right structure of, of writing this down. Um, and the GLM are in fact matrix elements of this uh, higher dimensional contour integral. I'm, I'm just flashing this to you. I'm not expecting you to, 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 to digest all of this. It has a sort of resolvent structure here. Um, and it is simply a, um, uh, an object that may remind you of, of the Borel transform of uh, this limiting uh, matrix W, whose coefficients are given by, again, the scattering T matrix. Yeah? So the scattering T matrix appears. That also made us very happy because that's the natural object you expect. You want to see scattering. But it's no longer a single scattering kernel that you see here. Everything's correlated for chi minus 1 collisions, OK? It's a big matrix that you need to sum over. Every, sc every scattering event knows about the other, OK? And that is the, the real reason behind this complication is because we are in a periodic setting. And I hope I'll be able to explain this to you. Now, there are some very beautiful, simple formulas. If you look, for instance, at the one collision term, where we can relate our limiting densities rho ml to express them in terms of um, J Bessel functions. And I've just written it down here. Um, there are uh, papers in the quantum chaos literature in um, particular by Bogomolny and Giraud, who are across the RER line in, in Orsay, um, who have found very similar formulas in diffractive systems. But let me not dwell too much on this. Excuse um, me, the, the, the G depends jointly on the uh, K uh, flights. Yeah. It's, you cannot uh, split into... No, ways. no, no. Everything depends on each other. Um, and you see, this is the formula, right? So the times you appear here, that's where they appear. And the momenta appear in this, um, uh, sorry, the, the, they appear here in this W matrix, right? And you integrate over this. You, so the way I think about this is a, a little bit like, this is like a propagator. This is like a potential in matrix form in K dimensions. So the, the K minus one collision term is sort of like a projection onto a k-dimensional space. And in fact, if you read our paper, you see we have a graph theoretical interpretation for this, for each k-term. And there you have some dynamics going on, a quantum dynamics. And the absolute miracle that happens, and I do want to say, is we get a positive expression. So it's not clear at all that these densities here should be positive, OK? Because we're doing quantum mechanics, and we're propagating forward in time, backward in time, we get cancellations. And the, the reason why we get a positive term is the way we've packaged everything. And just to say this, the, the, the way this derivation works is that we see in our formulas that as you move, you have a non-trivial y3, y4 y5, a non-zero non probability of, of, of seeing a momentum again that you've seen previously. And the reason for this is the Bloch decomposition. And I'll say a little bit more about this. You effectively, because of the periodic setting, seeing with a certain probability a finite dimensional selection of momenta. So you have a positive probability of seeing a momentum again that we've seen before. And now we put them all together as one in the density. You've seen here in our density, ah, yeah? The, so the y1, I would count y5 as y1. So I've summed already over those and packaged them together. And that's how we get positivity. If we just look at our expansion, it's not clear at all that this should be a positive um, uh, a density. A question? Yes. So, I mean, usually when you have, I mean, when you do block floquet um, uh, transformation, you have, I mean, you have the wavelength of the lattice yes. and you have inside the lattice cell. Yes. yes. So there is no separation. Exactly, there. because the, the, it disappears, right? The lattice cell disappears. That's the non-triviality of the limit we're taking because we're zooming out. We're taking a continuum limit and that's, 
what a lot of, of, of the people who say it's easy forgot, is that you're now going into a scaling limit where all your bands suddenly come together and start mixing up because of this particular scaling that we do. I'll, I'll explain it. Yeah? Okay, so... so we, <coughs> yeah? Uh, are these coefficients uh, invariant under rotation, or do you still see the orientation of the lattice? Uh? No, we don't see the lattice. In fact, if we start with any other lattice, Euclidean lattice, core volume one, so just for normalization, rotated or stretched, anything you want to do to it, any linear transformation, the answer will be the same. If we put another point inside the lattice, then the answer will be different, right? You get different uh, settings. But for any linear perturbation of the lattice, the limit process will be independent of it. OK, so here are the key steps of the proof. The first is Floquet-Bloch decomposition, where we reduce the dynamics to each Bloch subspace. And we assume, of course, because in the end we need to integrate again over the Bloch momenta, um, but we actually, we can think of uh, uh, the Bloch momentum being fixed for a moment, and we just look at each individual subspace um, of, a f of a given fixed Bloch momentum, as long as it's generic. So alpha has to be generic, random, etc. And then um, we use the Duhamel formula, as we've seen in, in several lectures here, there is no other way. The key point of our work and also of, of uh, uh, François Goltz and Emmanuel Cagliotti's work was to not use Duhamel expansion, but actually <coughs> use the, geom the geometry of the trajectories. That was absolutely crucial. Uh, here, there are no trajectories that I can see, um, and we just need to do Duhamel. And I'm not going to show you all those long formulas. We, we control the error terms. Um, um, let me, let me, you just need to trust me there. Let me try to explain to you what really is the key idea that's, that's new here. Um, and of course, if you apply the Duhamel formula, you see the unperturbed term appearing. Um, and if you iterate it, you get these, you know, multiple integrals over the free propagator potential, free propagator potential. And now you need to understand therefore the spectrum of the free propagator. And the really important point now is that we are in a Bloch subspace where the free propagator behaves very, very randomly. That's the assumption that's key to, to our theorem. So, um, the point is that the eigenphases of the free propagator, or in other words, the, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian are given by this formula. They are essentially m plus alpha squared. So, for example, uh, in two dimensions, this would just be m1 minus alpha 1 squared plus m2 minus alpha 2 squared, just values of a quadratic form. And we need to work with those. And what I'm going to tell you is that these guys behave random. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to tell you, and I, 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 I'm sure, okay, no, let me not give, give the punchline away too early. <laughs> so, so this is now our, our set. This is the spectrum, the unperturbed spectrum. Um, if you put those vectors into the quadratic form. And you can also, each, each eigenvector of the Laplacian um, corresponds to a shifted lattice point in this set. And so what one can show now is that the n minus first collision term, which comes from the Duhamel expansion, the kth order term in the Duhamel expansion, can be written in this form. It's some function evaluated at the square length of those lattice points, the first n plus 1. And then you have the corresponding momenta, if you like, the things defining the, the sort of labeling the eigenfunctions, and, and they're here. And they appear with a factor of r. So remember, and maybe I didn't highlight this enough, 
I'm in the limit when h is equal to r. So r is now my wavelength. And that's why the r appears with a momentum. Remember the definition of our scaling of the pseudo-differential operators had the h times momentum. So that's exactly this. And here you see a combined scaling that comes from a combination of h bar and mean free path lengths. So this function, think of it as having compact support, even though it doesn't. Um, it's a bit more singular than that. And we're summing over all those lattice points. Non-consecutive here means, and you've seen this also before in some of the lectures, that just consecutive elements shouldn't be equal. So pj should not be equal to pj plus 1. And what is also important here, I said the function should, you think, should uh, think of it as having compact support. Not quite in the first coordinates. They're invariant under uh, shifting each value here by the same t. So they're translation invariant. So in other words, this function only depends on the differences between the pj. Now, in fact, you can identify such a function with the uh, so-called endpoint correlation functions of um, uh, the values generated by these norm squared uh, and truncated by, um, um, by, the, uh, uh, by, by a truncation um, um, that's given by r. So as r tends to zero, you take more and more values, but you also restrict more and more the summation range. So that's exactly an endpoint correlation function of this process. And what I'm saying here is that our assumption is that we, in our considerations, can replace the lattice p, the shifted lattice, shifted by alpha, we can replace it by a Poisson point process in Rd. And you will tell me that I'm crazy, right? Who thinks I'm crazy? Please, hands up. Ah, yeah, you think I'm crazy. I knew that before. But uh, <laughs> uh, who thinks I'm not crazy? Please, come on. <laughs> Nobody thinks I'm... Manfred, you think I'm not crazy? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now this is a really important point. Um, and I'm going to just show you why I'm not crazy, because I don't want to leave you with a wrong impression. Um, and this is, in fact, something I've worked on over 20 years ago when I studied the Barry Tabor conjecture. Also, something that... Uh, Lebowitz and Blecher were very interested in uh, uh, over, over 20 years ago in connection with, with one of the basic questions in quantum chaos. And the, the point is the following. So here's your lattice. And the question you're really asking uh, um, is the following. So you have your lattice points. You look at a large annulus, so in our case, it's centered at, at alpha. In our case, the annulus has radius 1 over little r, and it has width given by this uh, r to the 2 minus d. Um, sorry, it has, a, yeah, it has sort of, yeah, and then there is a square here, so I probably should normalize by 2. So let me say it has an area related to that um, quantity. So the strip becomes smaller and smaller. It's normalized to have, in two dimensions, constant area. So you would expect only finitely many points to be in there. So if you now take the radius to infinity, i.e. little r to zero, <coughs> what you are conjecturing here is that the probability for a random radius to find k points in that little strip is given by the Poisson distribution. That's a major open conjecture. What I could prove over 20 years ago is that the two-point function actually is consistent with this conjecture. And that's what we can use to do some steps rigorously up to second-order perturbation theory. Um, there is an additional feature here that's very important and that we need not just the radii to be sort of Poisson distributed, but independently on the direction. Yeah, so we need that if we look at a small sector here, and we just look at the points there, we also want to see the Poisson distribution. So in other words, in this limit, really what it means that you have 
a sequence of radii that are Poisson distributed and that the arguments should be independent, converging to independent random variables. So in other words, the whole lattice should converge to a d-dimensional Poisson point process. In, the, in this particular scaling limit, okay, of, of course, the lattice, if you just look at the lattice, it'll never be a Poisson point process, right? But it is if you look at this, with respect to these particular uh, strangely scaled test sets. And so just to convince you, that's what I'm showing you now on the next slides, is I'm looking at the radii squared. Um, by the way, in two dimensions, they form a sequence of density one. So that's a good normalization. And my claim is that these converge to a Poisson point process, one dimensional, and that these become independent. And so if you have a, you know, the radii given by uh, Poisson point process in R plus and the directions becoming independent, then that's the same as saying that in, you know, the, uh, in, in the plane, if these are the sort of r uh, radial coordinates, polar coordinates, then that would be a two-dimensional Poisson point process. And so let me just show you this. Okay, so here's just the picture, right? And now you will say, yes, I am crazy because this doesn't look at all random, right? There's a structure in here. This is for a given radius r. r is, is 1 over little r on my picture there. And you see a very clear structure of things. But remember, we wanted to take r to infinity. And so I'm now just taking points in, the str in a strip, right, out there. So a strip of radius r with a certain window that is scaled exactly in the right way. And so it does look more random as you increase r. Another test you can do is you can just look at the consecutive spacing, spacings between the sequences of the length of my lattice point squared that I see, right? So you just order them. They're an ordered sequence, density one. And you just now look at the distribution of gaps. And I'm looking here at the joint distribution of gaps. The gaps are here. You know, this would be a very large gap. This would be a very small gap. And here we have uh, the angles. Actually, don't ask me why this starts at 1. Yeah, that must be a typo here. Um, and here is the histogram. And so you remember one of the properties of a Poisson point process is that the gap distribution between consecutive events is exponentially distributed. So we see this here. This is, in fact, a histogram of the joint distribution also for the associated angle. So each gap has an angle associated with it. And you see that it is jointly exponential. So that's numerical evidence, if you like, for our conjecture. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, almost, yeah, almost 20 years ago, I proved rigorously that if alpha is in fact Diophantine, so alpha, remember, is our Bloch vector, right? If it's Diophantine, you can prove that the two-point correlation function converges to that of a Poisson point process in an arbitrary dimension. And in fact, the Diophantine alpha for which I could prove, in fact, form a set of full measure. And in fact, you can also prove the convergence, not just for fixed generic alpha, but also for a random alpha uh, on, on expectation. And that enabled us in our first paper with, with Jory Griffin to actually prove that what I've showed you here converges um, up to second order in perturbation theory rigorously without this assumption. Um, and um, here are the open problems. I have no idea how to prove this for higher order correlation functions, um, but I'm not giving up. So this is on my list, on my to-do list. Um, it could be that some other scaling limits where we choose the wavelength to be much smaller than the radius or the other way around, that some of these considerations um, actually can be made rigorous, of course, when the wave oops, what have I done? When the wavelength is smaller than the radius, we are in the semi-classical regime, where also the scattering will be um, semi-classical, no longer quantum.
And when the wavelength is larger than R, we are in sort of the classical homogenization setting um, where uh, you know, people have developed other techniques to, to study problems of this form. So my idea would be to, to keep those two close because if, if, you, if, you, you know, if you just fix the wavelength and you take R to zero, then you are in the, in the sort of classical setting where, where one understands these problems. That's of course um, sort of more in, in, in um, Manfred Salmhofer's domain. Um, and we don't even need to do the, the weak scaling, uh, weak coupling limit there. Then it's really easy. It's just, you know, classical solid state physics. Um, and also, yeah, you, you, you could look at the limit of delta scatterers where the wavelength is um, scaled in a particular way with h bar. And then, of course, you know, extension to quasi crystals um, and other scatter configurations is a good one. The, the most pressing question for you, and I really invite you to, uh, to think about that and tell me if you have any idea, is we don't even know what is the long time, the hydrodynamic limit of our limiting process. It, it, it's sort of very explicit, but because it has this matrix form, I don't know whether it will be diffusive, super diffusive, or even ballistic. So um, I haven't really thought much about it except to stare at it and it is a non-trivial question I think and I think it's a, it would be a beautiful uh, result to show how um, how the long time limit behaves here okay well with that again thank you very much also to the audience for all coming here being live on screen and if there's anyone online thank you for for zooming in thank you So, are there questions or comments? Why do you expect super diffusion and what do you know about the time uh, decay? So, why do I expect super diffusion? Did I say I expect super diffusion? I put a question mark. The only reason why I expect super diffusion is because that's what we see in the classical setting. That's a theorem. Uh, Balin taught and I proved for the classical limit of the kinetic limit of the in the Boltzmann Grad limit of the periodic Lorentz gas. Um, I somehow don't expect a diffusive limit just because there are such strong correlations in the in the quantum dynamics. So let me just say I put a question mark here, right? It's not a conjecture; it's a question. And. Uh, I, I, yeah, I would expect super diffusive or even maybe something ballistic. Of course, that would be a bit boring. I would be disappointed if it's ballistic because I'd like to really say that if you first go on the boltzmann grad limit, you see something different from the standard solid state uh, sort of philosophy that, you know, po periodic potential is ballistic. So I'd, l I'd love to see uh, some diffusive component here. Uh, I mean, as far as I understand, for the weak coupling in periodic case, no, nothing is known. No, no I mean, uh, for the weak coupling, you don't even need to do the weak coupling. You, you can solve the problem completely. You have the band structures, you do oh, yeah. the classical solid state. And if you like, then you could take lambda to zero, but you don't need to because you already have your solutions, right? Oh, yes. So in the periodic case, that's where the easy part is. In the <laughs> I, I, the hard part is when you do the actual low density Boltzmann Grad limit. That's yeah. that's my point, and that's people have not appreciated that I think previously. Mm -hmm. Mario, in the classical weak coupling, is there any? Yeah, in the classical, yeah. you have uh, Fokker Planck Landau, linear Fokker Planck Landau. Mm -hmm. There are uh, uh, very old results by Dürer, Leibovitz, and uh, what? I don't remember. Goldstein. Goldstein, uh, for two dimensional, but there was a, a previous result by someone else. I, I don't remember, but I can give you the. the well, I think Cass uh, and Papa Nicolau. Yeah, Cass and Papa Nicolau in, in three dimensions, mm -hmm. and uh, Wait, the other one in. Uh, Cass and Papa Nicolau don't do it in, in yeah. periodic. It's, yeah, not, yeah. Uh, it's not periodic. It's no, 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 periodic, no, periodic. No, but what I asked whether in the periodic case, the ah, 
you have to ask to That's what <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know what happens in the periodic case. I don't think there is. For the weak cup in Of course, Kestem Papa Nicolau, but that's Serenka. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah. So it's a good question, Parent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have another question. Actually, so you you mentioned that in the limit you could get this this solution as a series, but can you write an equation or something? Because there are, uh, looking at the hydrodynamic limits, sorry, it's from just uh, an expansion in series, yeah. it's maybe uh, no exactly. And I don't have an equation. The the way the structure and you can see it in our paper is that for each term in the expansion we can define a graph on which, in a sense, you have a quantum dynamics, but going backwards and forwards in time. And only if you order terms in the way I've done, you get a positive density. So I think we could write down a, a sort of effective equation for each term k, but not for the global object. That I haven't found. And you, of course, want it for the global object, because... Um, so I, I don't have I'm it. Saying like an, the equation that was written by Francois. Yeah, like a generalized Boltzmann yeah. equation. I don't have it. I was looking for it, but I don't have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, are there other questions? If not, I think we can thank again the speakers and have a break.